Hello, Dematha Nation. Welcome to our 75th anniversary speaker. My name is Connor Glowacki, current staff member here at Dematha. And I'm joined today by fellow staff member and 2011 Dematha grad, Ben Flary, who will assist me in today's interview with Dematha and North Carolina state legend, Derek Wittenberg. Derek was a high school All-American for Morgan Bloom at Dematha, where he was paired with fellow class of 1979 alum, Sidney Lowe in the backcourt. In his junior year, Derek helped lead to DeMatha to a national championship. Derek then would go on to play under Jim Valvano at NC State and was a member of the 1982-83 team that won the NCAA national championship with a historic victory over then heavily favored University of Houston while also clinching the title of game MVP. Derek has held many coaching positions, including stints at NC State, George Mason, West Virginia, and Long Beach State, just to name a few. In 2003, Derek was named Northeast Conference Coach of the Year at Wagner University. The documentary, Survive in Advance, detailing NC State's 1983 title run and executive producer for the Gospel, according to Mac, a 30 for 30 documentary about Colorado football coach Bill McCartney, and in 2016, The Godfather of Basketball, which documented the life and career of the math legend Morgan Wooten. Derricks has also displayed a lifelong commitment to giving back to the community as he serves on the board of directors for the V Foundation for Cancer Research and is the co-founder of the Derek Wittenberg Foundation with a mission to extend the hands of financial assistance to deserving college students that find themselves facing the hindrance of finance as the barrier to the completion of their college degrees. Currently, Derek is the Associate Athletic Director for Community Relations and Student Support at North Carolina State, where he has held that position since 2015. With all that said, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest for the afternoon, Mr. Derek Wittenberg, the math of class of 1979. Derek, thanks for joining us today. And how have you been handling the pandemic, especially this year? How, how are things been going for you on your end? Uh, it, it's been, uh, challenging, but, uh, uh, we, we found a way to, to fight through it. Uh, as of last year, uh, March the 9th, uh, we were at the ACC tournament in Greensboro. And since they canceled the ACC, I have not been in my office at North Carolina States, uh, since March the 12th. And so it's been challenging. I just, I got tested today. And, uh, but I think uh, we all have made adjustments and uh, we're fighting through it and things are looking brighter and it's going to get better. So uh, I'm continuing to stay positive through these, during these tough times. Thanks, Derek. It's a, it's a pleasure having you on today and getting to speak with you now. Um, now you've played with two, you know, for two outstanding coaches in, in your career and among many, but you know, one being Jim Valvano and one being Morgan Wooten. Um, so this is kind of a two part question. I wanted to know maybe if, uh, you know, you could share a story about each one that we may have never heard before. And then maybe, you know, if, were there any similarities or differences between, you know, maybe the personalities or coaching styles of, of both Valvano and Wooten? Uh, <laughs> probably, uh, very different personalities, of course. Morgan was uh, more of a teacher and uh, uh, more reserved personality. And Valvano was more of a, a passionate, uh, energetic guy that was uh, in your face. And, and, and so different, different contrasts, different styles, different personalities. Um, yeah, you know, back in the, in the mid-70s, uh, you know, I heard so much about Morgan Wooten. And uh, I just thought and have opportunity to earn a college degree, to play at the highest level. Uh, I thought that the math was the way to go. And the name that stuck out to me was, was, was Morgan Wooten. My Morgan Wooten story goes back to when I was coaching at Wagner College. I had just won the championship at Wagner. And Morgan has his camp up at Mount St. Uh, out in Mount St. Mary's. On, uh, actually, was uh, in Frostburg. And Morgan calls me like Wednesday night and said, he needs a speaker. Badly, he needs a speaker. So I'm at Wagner. I'm in New York. 
Uh, he's on the other side near West Virginia, way up in Maryland County. So I, um, I, I, he calls me. I said, he said, Derek, you know, are you available? I said, Coach, anything for you. I, he said, will you be a speaker? Come up Thursday. I said, sure, I'll come up there. I said, how far is it? He said, oh, it's not that far. You, you, you're probably like about three hours, or three or four hours. So I get up and uh, something told me Thursday, get up early in the morning. So I got up really early and I started driving from New York. And I'm going like, I get to 81 and I'm getting to seven. I said, I thought he said it was three hours. <laughs> it's about a five hour ride, man. And, and I got about two hours to go. So I got to go 900 miles an hour to make sure I get on time because I don't want to disappoint Morgan. So I get there and, and I'm doing my speech, doing my thing. I did a little shooting clinic for Morgan in front of all these kids. There's 600 kids there doing my shooting clinic. So Morgan meets me after the clinic. Now, he never pays anybody, ever. In 30, 40 years, Morgan never – I don't know if Morgan Wooten had a wallet. I've never seen him pull money out of his pocket. So he pulls to the side, and he reaches his hand, and he's got a folded-up check for $300. I said, Morgan must be sick. He's paying me. What the hell? So what I did was – I, look, I said, Morgan, thank you so much. I thought it was a joke. Now, now his, his son was running the camp. So Morgan might have snuck and wrote me a check out of the camp, not knowing but that Joe not knowing. So I looked at this check, and I saw Fredericksburg, Maryland. I said, Coach, I see you. Man, I went and hurry up. I drove about 100 miles an hour to get to, get to uh, Fredericksburg, Maryland, so I could cash this check. Before, <laughs> before Morgan figured it out. So that's my one Morgan Wooten story. Uh, uh, I love the man. I love what he taught us. And then an op opportunity when I went to state, uh, I first played, was recruited by Norm, uh, Norm Sloan. And then from there, Norm Sloan left and went to Florida. And then Jim Valvano came in. And uh, Jimmy was, was unbelievable personality. I first met Coach Valvano when I was a senior in high school, I played in the Boston shootout. And uh, we played the New York team with Red Bruin and all these great players from New York. And I played with uh, Earl Jones and a bunch of Sydney and a bunch of guys from D.C. on our AAU team. We beat them in a triple overtime game. So after the game, Valvano comes up and grabs me and Sydney by the neck. He said, I love you two guys. I'm, I'm Jim Valvano from Iona College. So fast forward one, one year, Norm leaves. Lo and behold, here's Jim Balvano walking in the press conference. And I see him walking in, and I said to Sidney, I said, Sid, uh, that's the guy that, that – that, that's that crazy Italian guy that says he owns a college. I said – he said he didn't own a college. He said that's I own a college. <laughs> so that's my Jim Balvano story. As you know, for Jim, you know, obviously we won a national championship. I ended up coming back and coaching with Jim. And Jim uh, passed away 10 years after the champion, you know, 10 years after that championship with cancer. And uh, I was the only player that was a pallbearer on his funeral selected by his family. I'm the only player that was selected to be a founding board member for the Jimmy V Foundation. So I have very close and fond relationships with those two men and, and their families. And uh, I just, you know, I, I appreciate um, DeMatha really uh, starting starting that journey for me and really the reason of why I've had so much great experience in basketball. And thanks for sharing, Derek. Um, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, you, know, you played for Morgan and you played for Coach Bavano. And then you were part of these, you know, you produce documentaries on both of the coach on both of the coaches and with NC State, you know, your title run. What was it like being on that side of it, being part of putting all this information together and maybe seeing it from a different perspective? Well, the film business, I got into the film business by accident. I actually uh, I got fired at Fordham, which probably one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. Everybody says, you know, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I just came off a year where Fordham University, which is probably the oldest gym in the country the toughest academics in the Atlantic 10 and probably one of the worst budgets. I came in in 2005, I came in fourth in that league. And the league was really, really good with John Chaney and 
Xavier was in the league at the time. Temple, uh, you know, Dayton was in the league. Uh, UMass was really good. GW was really good. St. Joe's was a top 25 team, and we came in fourth. And then, uh, uh, you know, a couple years later, I'm fired for no reason. But you, you know what? It was one of the best things that ever happened for me because I'm sitting on the couch and I'm watching the uh, Fab Five story and I, I reached out to a friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Hawk, and I said, you know what? I think the 83 story is just as good or better than the, the Michigan Fab Five story. And that's how it happened. And uh, I worked for ESPN and uh, we put the film together. It took me two years. I was turned down three times ESPN. I was turned down by CBS. I was turned down by TNT, but I was persistent. And we finally, you know, we didn't know how good the stories would be. And we finally, uh, in 2013, we launched the film. And as of today, uh, even last Christmas, 68 million people watched Survive in Advance. It's the most watched sports documentary in the world. It's the first two-hour film of the 30 for 30 series. So if I would have been still coaching, I wouldn't have the opportunity to uh, have a reach of that many people and people I just had a Zoom call with 250 coaches from Ireland who watch Survive in Advance. Wow. So I get stuff like that all the time because the lessons they learned about that journey of that team and Jim Balbano's leadership and, and just those guys, a group of ordinary guys that achieved something that was extraordinary. So uh, sometimes things that looks like it's bad fortune actually is, is good fortune. And I tell that story, I've been, motivational speaking for the last 30, 30 some odd years. And I always start off with that story that being fired is always not the worst thing in the world. Sometimes it's the best thing in the world. Thanks for sharing. And it, yeah, it's a, it's a great documentary, especially this time of the year with the NCAA tournament starting tonight. I mean, there's, there's nothing better than watching it when college basketball is at its full swing. Um, for everybody joining us today, if you'd like to ask, have a question for Derek, feel free to let us know in the chat bar. Then myself or Ben will call on you to ask that question. And I believe first we have a question from our very own Mike Jones. So Mike, go ahead and ask your question for Derek. Appreciate it, Connor. What's up, Coach? Coach, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, I, I, great stories. You've always had great stories. I, I want to ask you a, a basketball question, though. Um you know, you've been around the game for a long time, and I know a lot of times these days, especially with the young guys that are playing our game, there's always comparisons with the older generation and, and the new school players. And I want to know, what in your mind, what do you think is the biggest difference in the game now than it was back in the 80s and the 70s when, you know, a lot of times being compared, people talk about, you know, the, the physicality and, you know, you can't touch people anymore and things like that. What do you think is the biggest difference in the game today than back when you played? Well, I think one of the things we, we what was much more of a priority than it is now is that uh, um, winning uh, was much more important for the uh, older generation than I think for the new generation. I think it's uh, slighted more for the individual you know, now because of social media, guys can get on social media, you know, how many hits I got on Instagram, and, and TikTok, and Facebook. I think there's so many other distractions that it takes away from the team concept. And, and I think that especially at the math, that, that it, it was all based on our, our team accomplishments in the process. And I think now the kids have, there's too much access to kids now because everybody else can influence them about what they should be doing as an individual, as opposed to the coach. You know, I had a, uh, Boo Williams brought me down to talk to uh, his AAU parents. And I had a talk called the confusion. And the confusion is that the parents want to be the coach and the coach want to be the parents and the players want to listen to the coach and coach players supposed to be listening. Uh, they try to listen to parents that's the confusion of basketball now. You know, we have the only profession, coach, that everybody in the world thinks they know how to coach basketball. Everybody. I mean, it's not football. It's not baseball. It's not tennis. Everybody says when they see basketball, because they can go out in the backyard and take a couple shots, or they can go uh, play in their, their old man league of 60 and old. Everybody thinks they can coach basketball. 
So the difference of the day is that the kids are being taught, uh, you know, how many three point shots I can shoot. What's my numbers. You know, when I was coaching at the end, uh, guys used to look at that right after the game, they would look at their phones. And the first question their AAU coach or somebody would ask was, how much minutes you get? Uh, how many points did you score? It's all about the individual. So I think that's the biggest difference is the mentality. And the one thing I tried to do when I was coaching is that I tried to recruit guys from winning programs that understood winning and not individuals. Sometimes you get a kid that went to a school and he averaged 30 something points, but he's never won the championship. That's a kid that I didn't want to recruit. I want to recruit the kids from Lake Clifton, DeMatha, Martyr Day. I wanted to find the winning programs. And if I can get the third, fourth, fifth best player on that team, then I, he's already embedded in the culture of, of winning. And that one was important to me. So that's the biggest difference I see. I talked to a lot of kids and parents of today, uh, even uh, the parents at NC State. And the bottom line is they only interested in their kid and what happens in them. And here's what the thought, Coach, and it's the last thing I'm going to say. The kids think, let me see how well I do, and, let's, and then let's see if we win. That's the current mentality. Let me see how well I do first, because I got to get my numbers, and then let's see if we win. Great answer. Appreciate that, Coach. Yep. Thanks, Coach Jones. Thank you, Derek. <clears throat> um, yep. So we'll go to the floor now. Uh, we got a question from our very own David Aldridge, uh, class of '83. Uh, David, oh yeah. I'll mute your mic and ask uh, Mr. Wittenberg your question. D. Witt, what's up, man? David. <laughs> Hey, now, David, let me tell you something. Yes, that sir. TW, that TW means Team Wittenberg, not Tiger Woods, okay? <laughs> Just want to let you know. <laughs> I only associate with winners. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I just want – I wanted you to – Give a, give us a couple of, of your funniest or, or best recruiting stories from back in the day, from over the years, because like I said in the chat, I don't know how any college coach gets anybody to ever commit to play for them with all the with all the chicanery that's going on out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Man, where do you want me to start? <laughs> just just pick the ones that you can pick the ones that you don't have to put any names to. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Well, the, the the worst one in the world is that I have I'm, I'm recruiting Chauncey, I'm recruiting Stefan Marbury, which we probably were going to get. So because I came from Colorado, I'm recruiting Chauncey Bill. I'm recruiting uh, Chauncey Billups, and, and, and but I was at Colorado for three years, so I know Chauncey very well. So I Bobby Krim is, is he says how in the world. What are you doing to get Chauncey Bills? I said, Bobby, I got a relationship with this kid. So he got nervous. So we 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 got Chauncey Bills on campus. And Bobby gets so nervous because he thinks that you know some shenanigans is going on. But me and Chauncey were very close. I recruited him in ninth grade in Colorado. So Bobby Crimmins, does not knowing a lot about Chauncey, he says, Now, Chauncey, now we're probably gonna get stuff on. We got Drew Berry. If you come here. You know, you you gonna get a lot of playing time and everything. So I didn't I didn't hear this conversation. So Chauncey comes up to me and says, he says, Coach Britt, he says, I wanna I wanna come to Georgia Tech, but Bobby Crimmins told me that I'm not gonna start. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, not gonna start. Wait a minute. I, I said, Chauncey, wait here. I went and called Bobby Crimmins. I said, Bobby, this is one of the other than Marbury. This is the next best guard in the country. He could start anywhere. <laughs> Lord, and, and needless to say, you know what happened, David? Uh, he ended up going back to Colorado. <laughs> he <Yeah>. didn't sign. <laughs> <laughs> that was unbelievable. i tell you one story. I got in trouble. I got in trouble with this. So we're recruiting stuff on Marbury. And I could, uh, and, and Lord rest his soul, the, the late uh, Jerry Tarkanen for UNLV. So back in the day, David, just because you sign a kid, that don't mean they start recruiting. They, they start recruiting them harder. Right, right, right. <laughs> when a kid commits to you verbally, now you got to really work. And so Terry Carcana kept, I kept 
kept recruiting them, kept recruiting them. The kid committed to us in November, but the signing date was in the spring. So he kept recruiting the kids. So I said, I said, the news reporter came to me and said, what do you think about this, uh, you know, Coach Cartagena recruiting this kid? I said, it's unethical. And boy, they put that in the paper. And Bobby Kremers ripped my butt. I mean, he said, don't ever make a comment like that against another coach, regardless of true, blah, 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 blah. So we get back in there, we get back to North Carolina. And he said, he gets all excited. Yeah, uh, Stefan is, is, is coming. And we're in the room, we're waiting on the call and everything. And the family's going to call us and make another official uh, verbal commitment. And I'm sitting there quietly in the room. And I said, Derek, why are you not excited about Stefan uh, uh, not signing at Georgia Tech? I said, do you see any papers in front of us? We have no signatures. He is not, and two, I get a signature. That's when I'm going to get happy. <laughs> I said, we got more work to do. <laughs> so that's two of, that's two of my recruiting stories. I got 500 of them, but I, that's, a, I could give you those two without incriminating nobody. <laughs> <laughs> but David, I just want to say we were inducted in the DeMatha Hall of Fame at the same time. And I love your work. Uh, you, you, you've been a champion for us in the NBA, in the media business. You've been great ambassador for us. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, also give my condolences to your brother. I saw that on Facebook. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you. I, I just, you know, we, we gleam with joy when we see you were the first, you know, other you and James Brown, you guys were the guys that were mm -hmm. representing that, uh, the math and the media. And I just want to let you know, you, it didn't go unnoticed that we we recognize your work and what Appreciate you've done it, for us. And we're proud of you. And we we, we are so happy that you're a part of the Math family. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Derek. And David, thanks for your question. Our next question is from Robert Schiller. So Robert, feel free to unmute your mic and ask Derek your question. Yeah, good afternoon, Derek. Good to see you. How you doing? Hey, Rob. Hey, how you doing, man? <laughs> He's right here in Raleigh with me. <laughs> I sure am. And uh, what Derek uh, did not include in his bio is he's actually been on the North Carolina Symphony Board for the last three years. And uh, thank you for your, your work with the symphony. I've, I've been at the North Carolina Symphony. I'm their CFO. I've been here for about uh, 17 years, um, class of 85. And um, it's been an honor to get to, to know you, Derek, and, and your wife, uh, Jacqueline, over the last five years. And uh, thank you for your contributions uh, to this community, especially with the Derek Wittenberg Foundation, which um, I think uh, I might have mentioned at, at the beginning, uh, has really been instrumental in helping uh, several um, college students finish their college career, whether they're in community college or in a four-year College. These are kids who are having true financial difficulties, and um, through your fundraising and the, the work of, of Jacqueline um, and work through the, the community, you've raised just a ton of money to help these kids, uh, these students complete their, their academic career. So, so thank you. So, but my, my question is this I was watching actually the video this morning. It's the final timeout, it's a national championship game, 44 seconds to go. What was the play that Jim Valvano called? in that last time out? Uh, in the last 44 seconds, we had a play called the five play, which is uh, kind of a stack, two stacks, Sydney's in the middle. And then we run Thurl Bailey uh, opposite uh, to the uh, to the left side on a double, a double screen so he can take that little baseline shot. And they leave me open on the right side for a one-on-one -on -one opportunity, either – if the guy comes up and back door, Sydney can throw a lob to me, or if he doesn't, then I catch the ball, uh, isolate on the right side and play one on one as a five play. So we had that all set up and everything. We didn't anticipate uh, Houston coming out in a one three one trap. So it wasn't time to look over to the coach and say, uh, "Coach, we can't run the five play. Uh, they're in a trap." So we were at living knowing that. The math of time and score that we got to take the last shot. So we're passing around. And so you got a clock in your head. And then when uh, Thurl got that ball with 10 seconds left in the corner, he saw me and, and luckily he threw the ball to me and I 
retrieved it with two hands, like I'm taught in Damatha, not one. Retrieved it with two hands and in one motion, got it up there. And uh, nice pass to Lorenzo, he dunks it in. So, uh, you know, you got to have, you got to be good. You have to have a little bit of luck and winning a national championship. You know, I don't know if everybody knows, uh, Tom is going to help me with this, but I believe that Sydney and I are the only two teammates that's won a national championship in high school and a national championship in college. And uh, I, I just think that uh, that's, that's huge in so many historical moments. And uh, I just, I look back at it and then they have the opportunity to visit the White House twice, Sydney and I. We visited the White House in 1983 with Ronald Reagan, the late Jan Russ, Bob Gagan, and Morgan Wooten. We visited Ronald Reagan in the Oval Office. And then to come back in 2016 and visit the, the first African-American pres, uh, president, uh, Barack Obama, and also visit the Red in the Blue Room. And then have an opportunity, guys, from growing up in Washington, D.C., being out on the White House lawn and giving a speech about your experience growing up in D.C. and talking about your experience uh, being in the White House with the first African-American uh, president, which is a powerful moment and a moment in time that we, we should not take for granted. Because growing up in Washington, D.C., driving around Pennsylvania and Avenue, wondering what it was like to be in the White House or uh, the most powerful person in the world. And to have that opportunity to, to do that and to see the first African-American president was huge and, and something that I'll never forget. Thank you, Robert. And, and thank you, uh, Derek, again. Uh, so, Derek, I kind of want to take you back to your to your high school days, your DeMatha days. Um, you know, was there a specific maybe your favorite teacher that you had or a favorite class that you had um, while you were at DeMatha? One maybe that kind of sticks out of your head in your head. Uh, you know, favorite class, favorite teacher? Well, my favorite class and my worst class and my biggest fear was Buck Off, the late Buck Off. Man, you had to be prepared. You couldn't, you, in the quizzes, you couldn't, he would change the quiz questions up, man. He changed the answers up. So Buck Off in English, he made you learn. You could not finagle anything in Buck Offit's class. And I finally figured out what Buck offered. Man, you just got to read it, learn the material, and know it. Because if you try to take it, it's is not going to work. One of my favorite guys was Buck Off. He made you learn. And I can never forget Buck Off. And, and, and Mr. Conyers uh, in, in biology, those two for sure. Uh, those, those guys were some, uh, there's two teachers that, that I would never forget. Thank God I didn't have Morgan in the class because I know Morgan would never give you anything. But Buck Offit was, was unbelievable. I love Buck Offit. He always told you the truth. He was tough. He gave you tough love. And he made you, that's what I like about the discipline, about the math and the way you dress, the way you carry yourself. And they made you learn. They didn't, they didn't give you any shortcuts at the math and that, and that, that, that was a good trait to have. Hey, Derek, we got a question here from Philip Berger. So, Philip, go ahead on your mic and ask your question. Hey, Derek, uh, great to see you. Um, I, I coach a lot of basketball at the youth level, so uh, fourth and sixth graders, and I totally buy into your thought that, you know, today's players are really about stats and playing time and highlights. So how do you, how do you get them to buy into the team approach because um, I think in the older days, and maybe Valvano was like this by like a Bobby Knight, you would just kind of break the players down until they bought in. You can't really do that in today's environment. So how, how would you get, you know, that team mentality, you know, at NC State or at a high school today? Uh, you have to constantly uh, sell them on uh, not they, what they want to hear, but what what's the ultimate goal, right? Because I think even in college, we make the mistake. All these guys sell them on the fact that they're going to be the pros, knowing that 99% of them are not going to be a pro. But that's what they want to hear, right? So you got to give them of both, the college level. And, and, and to me, I think you got to give them a steady diet of what it's like to be a part of something bigger than yourself. 
Yeah, you know, people talk about championship teams for the rest of their life. It's a special moment when you're part of a group of guys that do something that winning the champion. Somebody just sent me a, a picture of me back in when I was in, I guess I was uh, 16 years old, and Mr. Bates' AAU team where we won the championship. And it's me and Sydney and Thurl Bailey, a bunch of guys. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 I forgot. Yeah, in AAU, I won the championship. I don't even think more AAU guys, are, are they, do they want to win the championship or they just want to have great players and win a lot of games? I don't know what, what, what they're selling but I think at, at all levels, you've got to try to reiterate team. You got to re- reiterate winning. And if you can continue to instill that, and you know, you got some individuals that that have to achieve and, and try to balance out playing time. And the one thing I always talked about with playing time with kids is that players determine who played, not the coach. So if you play well in practice, everybody deserves. It. If I got ten people to play well. Ten people are going going to play well. You know, you other two that are sitting on the on the bench, you got to fight your way through it. So players determine who play, not the coaches. And everybody always want to find an excuse that uh, it's not my fault they're not playing; it's the coach's fault. No, 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 no. We the coaches sit around and have a meeting, and we say, okay, here's the top ten guys, here's the starters. They've earned it. So I would just continue to. And sometimes you have to bring people in to reinforce your message, right? Sometimes they get uh, they get deaf to your ears. Sometimes you got to bring somebody else in to speak to your message. And I think that that, that would help you out a lot. Thanks, Philip. Great question. Uh, Derek, next question we got from, I uh, hope I'm not saying this wrong, Mike Kalkloff. Uh, if you want to un- unmute your, your mic and ask uh, Derek your question. Mike Colclough. If not, Derek, I can. Okay, can you hear me now? There we go. There we go. Okay, hey, good to see you, Derek. Good to see you, man, from the old neighborhood, Glenard. And I, I appreciate you taking the time out to, to speak with us, man. And, and uh, when I get an opportunity, I'm going to head down there to North Carolina to kind of see you and check you out. Hey, uh, I just want a uh, quick question about the recruiting process. And, um, the one and done rule from folks going into college and then that lore, particularly for schools like NC State, University of Maryland, Duke, your North Carolinas, it's not a lot of kids that are who are eligible for the for the NBA staying that one year, staying that two years. And I think some of the the league now in the NBA is getting a little diluted from players not learning the fundamentals like we used to learn uh, at the math of the, like you mentioned, catching the ball with two hands, um, just the shooting, uh, passing and things we used to learn over at the math. Of. So just kind of speak about the recruiting process for the uh, college ranks and, and that, that lore going into the NBA. There was a survey done with division three players Division two players and division one players. Twenty five percent of division three players thought they could all go in the NBA. Right. Fifty six percent of division two players thought they'd go in the NBA. God knows, you know, at division one, every one of them jokers thinking they're going to the NBA. Right. And so the mentality and the indoctrination of how basketball has evolved has got everybody thinking they're going to go to the NBA. Okay. Let's clarify that one. So that mentality is passed on. And I remember with Mo Rivers, the, 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 the coach, uh, great high school coach at Rice High School um, in, in New York, um, in Harlem, a great coach. He had great players. Felipe Lopez, all these great players. And his last year high school coaching before he went to St. John's, he was walking around the eighth grader. And the eighth grader had his uncle, his two parents, two of his workout guys. He had about six guys with him. And they're walking touring the high school. And, and they, 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 the, the uncle and the coach says, Mo, you got to take this kid. This kid is going to the league. 
Now he's in the eighth grade. Right. <laughs> he ain't even going to high school yet. So that just tells you what this where this mentality is. Okay. The one, let me clarify the one and done. One and done is is overrated. There's only about five or six kids every year that's that's one and done. Right. Five or six kids. And Hunter, our big Damatha kid, he might be going next year, right? Yeah. I heard he, he might be leaving. But it's only five or six kids a year that's one and done that's going. So I, I get that. You know, for them, yeah, I get that. It's the other guys that you got to appreciate the experience of the, co- the, of the college game. Right. There ain't nothing wrong with the college game. You know, it's, it's, it's fun. It's exciting. It's great. You can see by the tournament. It's nothing like going to that tournament and have a chance to win that tournament. So it's nothing against the tournament. So most of our kids are thinking that all this is about is the NBA. And it's yeah. not, and that's not true. You know, it's, you know, you, you, maybe we all want you to go, but if it doesn't happen, and you can go overseas or you can be successful doing something else. So I just yeah. think it's a mentality that's going on. And I didn't like the rule that they made kids stay for one year, you know, because the great players and, and the Kevin Garnett's and the Kobe Bryant's, and, you know, and the LeBron James, they're good enough to go, let them go. But if you, if you're not, if, if now they have to make a decision, see if they can go, they got to say, okay, I'm just going to go to the NBA. And then you don't have to worry about it. Right. But once they come to you, well, their game plan is what? They're coming to use you for a year to go to the NBA. <laughs> mm-hmm. So they may not be part of your overall plan. Yeah. So it's it's just the way it is today. And uh and, and coaches got to manage that. And if you can look at Duke University, they've had several one and done. You look at Kentucky, two teams that been used to having one and dones. And all of a sudden, it's caught up with them, right? Mm-hmm. And now they don't have no one and dones, and and now the development of the other kids are not there. Yeah. So you can see how it can backfire on you, but that's just what coaches got to manage today. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that, Derek. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Mike, for your question. I just want to say this too, guys. One thing that you that we all take for granted about coaching, especially in college. And it doesn't say anything in my bio about this one particular thing that I learned at the math. And I talked about good kids and good people. And Morgan said, always surround yourself with good people. So in my years of coaching, 98% of my kids that stayed with me graduated. Okay? Every kid, almost every kid that stayed with me graduated. Number two, at Wagner College, I had six guys on the dean's list and had a 3.0 GPA for four straight years. I had almost a, a 2.9 GPA at Fordham University. But more important, none of my kids, no NCAA violations, and none of my kids got in trouble in my 11-year tenure coaching as a head coach. So we always look and evaluate coaches on the premise of only winning games and not have they shown leadership and ran a great program. You have to do both. You can't compromise. And that's what you learn at the map. We don't compromise. We win, we study and we be educated and we become good people. And that I took that philosophy with me in coaching in college, and that was my greatest achievement that I graduated kids. All my kids still call me on birthdays and holidays. I got a connection, a relationship with everybody that I coach, whether well, the assistant coach or head coach. That's at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Derek, thanks for thanks for sharing. And could you go, you know, we alluded to it earlier, and I know Robert did as well. Um, your work with the Jimmy v, Jimmy v Foundation and with your own foundation, the Derek Wittenberg Foundation. Can you kind of go into detail about you know, all of the work that you put into both of these um, organizations? Well, you know, uh, Jimmy is uh, obviously he was very special to me. And then when he died of cancer, just before he left this earth, he, he, he put together a board on the legal pad and 
I was one of those guys. And uh, as of today, you know, we want to fight this dread disease. All of us are going to be affected by cancer, obviously. And uh, we have done some tre tremendous work. 100% uh, of every dollar uh, donated to V Foundation goes directly to cancer research. We've given up over 600 grants across the country. Uh, we've raised uh, nearly, uh, you know, half a billion dollars that's leveraged to a billion and a half dollars. Uh, we've done some tremendous things at the Beat Foundation. We've raised awareness. And now the, the whole concept of cancer is not a death sentence, right? Uh, we've had some breakthroughs. Uh, people are surviving and thriving with cancer. And so, uh, but we must continue uh, that work because so much, it's such a dreaded disease and it, it, it's, it affects so many people. So uh, I enjoy the work we're doing with the Jimmy V Foundation. It's a great organization. We got David Robinson and Billis, and we got some great board members. Uh, so, but it was like, it was wonderful uh, just being in that journey for the last 28 years with, with, with that foundation and seeing it grow. And obviously ESPN is a big part of our, our, our whole organization. So uh, great work there. And then my, my, my real passion was uh, uh, education. As a first generation graduate in my family, uh, leaving from DeMatha, going to, going to college and getting my degree at NC State and uh, always wanted to, had a passion for education. So I started this, when wanted to start this foundation for years and, and uh, we had given away almost uh, half a million dollars in five years and over 120 some scholarships. This year we'd be giving away 32 scholarships to local schools uh, in, in schools across the state of North Carolina. I'm excited about that work because it's not all about, um, and Morgan taught me this, you know, you use basketball and don't let it use you. So basketball was a part of who I am, but not all what I do. And so uh, I've used the basketball and the, the notoriety of that to help people in other areas. So I, I'm excited about that. You know, community work is being present and being involved. And we believe in my leadership that if everybody help each other a little bit, then everybody can grow. And so last year, the last five years, my wife and I have averaged over 192 events in the state of North Carolina and across the country. And uh, so I believe in, you know, people work from eight to five, but I maximize my time from five to 11. From five to 11, I, I, I work, 90% of the people in the country because everybody's work stopped from eight to five, but from five to 11, I'll work everybody because most people are trying to, they're, they're watching TV and they're going to sleep. But so from five to 11, or I would say five to 12, I'm out working everybody in the country. That's, that's just my philosophy. Thank you, Derek. And, you know, thank you for always being committed to giving back to the community. I know you're, you're very proud of, of that. So, so thank you for all the work you've done. Um, now, Tom Ponton has been bugging me. So I know he's having a little bit, you know, bit of trouble filling out his NCAA bracket. You know, so he, <laughs> he, uh, he wants to know, you know, who's your final four uh, and that your, your eventual national championship winner. I know we talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but uh, if you could give Tom Ponton a little bit of help with his bracket. Uh, I forgot who's in the regions, man. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, rest assured, uh, I, I think Gonzaga is going to be there, and I don't. I haven't seen the matchups, but I think Gonzaga is going to be there. I think Baylor is going to be there. I don't know the other two, um, but I think that eventually that uh, it might be Gonzaga's year. Um, uh, they got a balanced team. Uh, they have what I call a lot of two-way players meaning that they're committed to defense. Everybody on their team can defend at every position. And every guy on Gonzaga's team can make an offensive play. They can knock down a three. They can put the ball on the floor. So I like the balance of their team. And especially during the NCAA, you're on a neutral court. The ball's not going to always go in the basket. So can you do the other little things? Can you continue to defend? 
Can you get it to the basket? Do you have some inside play? Can you get to the free throw line? And I think Gonzaga's uh, has a chance, but anything can happen in the NCAA term, you don't know. So, Tom, offline, you got to call me when I got the brackets, and I can tell you uh, what's going on. And um, But those two teams, to me, uh, they, they have the ability because they're well-balanced on offense and defense. Thanks, Derek. Before we get to our final question here, I think Troy Peace, Troy Peace, if you want to unmute your mic, Troy's got something to say, I believe, to, to Derek. <laughs> Well, how you doing, buddy? Troy, peace. I got a question. You claim that a lot of us owe you money. I want to know who owes you the most. Let's start with you, okay? <laughs> Let's start with you. You know, I used to collect gas money in the, in the cafeteria, and some of you guys came up short. I had a Volkswagen Beetle back in the day. It only took about $7 to fill it up. And I'm giving all you guys ride home. If I get $2 a piece, I mean, I, I, I can get some work done. I can fill the car up. <laughs> As you know, I, guys, I do have a DeMatha jacket on that Ponton did not give me. I had to buy it. <laughs> you know at DeMatha, they don't give you nothing, okay? You have to make a donation and you have to buy. So, so Ponton... I got a, you got another two hundred and fifty dollar check coming from me, and for my donation for being on. See, I got I know I have to donate for being on because I know Demetha not giving me nothing. So I got to I got to bring a check to Demetha pretty soon. And part time, the reason why I bring a check, I want to hold on to the money a little bit. I don't like going <laughs> online and you getting the money directly. I want to I wanted to hold it for a little bit more interest for another couple of days. See, I learned that from Morgan too, uh, Tom. Well, we're going to give you an orange. Money. We're going to give you an orange drink and a T-shirt, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, guys, I'm going to tell you, Dematha and the relationships that I have uh, is invaluable. And and I always uh, preference what I see a Dematha guy is Dematha for life, and. We have a special bond with the math and guys across the country, whether you played or everybody went to school. Like you said, there's only 38, there's 38,000 high schools in the country, but there's only one to math. <laughs> Appreciate it there again. Yeah, it's gonna, this is going to be an exciting time. This NCAA tournament, we got Ronnie Everhart, class of 80, assistant coach at West Virginia. Josh, yes. Harden, uh, class of 2017 at UConn. Justin Moore, class of 2019 at Villanova. And Hunter Dickinson, class of 2020 at Michigan. So we got a lot of DeMatha to root for also in the tournament. And, uh, you know, thanks for coming on again, Dare. Before we go, I'm going to toss it over to Ben from a message from our advancement office. Yeah, so uh, Derek, just on behalf of DeMatha, again, I just want to say thank you very much for it's It's been a real pleasure having you on and, you know, hearing all these great stories, you know, about Morgan, about Coach Valvano, about your, you know, community service work. So it's, it's been a great pleasure to, to speak with you and, and have you on. Um, just got to put my advancement hat on. You know, as we conclude, uh, we'd like to ask for your support for the Fund for DeMatha. Uh, it's critical to the school in supporting our ongoing mission of educating faithful gentlemen and scholars. Uh, you can give online at www.dematha.org uh, or by mail. So, again, Derek, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, we'll have you back up here soon at Dematha. Uh, stop by and, and say hello. So, thanks again, and thank you, everyone, for your, for your great questions today. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Derek.